Norman here as always with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? I, I always start Michigan week by singing it's the most wonderful week of the year. I feel like if I was more confident the game was absolutely going to happen, I might do that this this week, but we will hold hold true to our great tradition, which is daily shows during Michigan week, because it is this is the high holy days of the uh, Ohio State football calendar. Can you sing it with a question mark uptick? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> my, my singing is already bad enough. Let's not complicate anything. Yeah. And with your your fam- famous uh, Australian accent, please. <laughs> it's the most wonderful week of the year, mate. Maybe. Yes. So <laughs> thank you, Tom, for that. That was great. I'm, hopefully people didn't skip all the way through that and they just soaked it in. But yes, I don't care what we don't, Tom and I don't care what anybody else is saying right now. We celebrate Michigan Week until we are told not to celebrate Michigan Week. So we are going to freaking celebrate it. Uh, and, and first let's talk basically this, this show, because we don't know how deep to get into stuff yet. We've got time to do that. We're talking like, you know, 30,000 foot overview of the state of the state of Michigan's program right now. And, uh, what is going on there first, Tom line came out today. The one I saw Ohio state minus 30 biggest line uh, for OSU ever, uh, perhaps the biggest line ever in this game before. I don't know, Taft was president or something like that. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the Carmen, Ohio game where Ohio State lost, uh, what, 86 to nothing in like 1897. I don't know if point spreads were a thing back then, but if they were, it was probably bigger than 30. But yeah, I mean, I, I wish you had, uh, I wish we had waited for you to do that big reveal because we you you told me what the point spread was about yeah. 30 seconds before we hit record. And it was one of those like, have you seen the um, like the uh, Chris Pratt gif where he's just reacting like, wow, yeah, that was me. That was me going, wait a minute. And then you think and you're like, well, I don't know that I'd want to take the points because then you're looking at it and it's like, you know, it's like Alabama against uh, some team and you're just like the whole game. You're just going, oh, you can just see this coming. Oh, you can just see this coming. Oh, you can just see this coming. And then it usually usually happens so yeah 30 points seems like a completely ludicrous number and then it's like well is it well and and tom i you might think it's not that ludicrous when i tell you that i saw a little bit ago that right now michigan may be down to their true freshman quarterback dan Mm valari i believe is his name who is a two-star steal from dartmouth perhaps like they got him away for them sorry my my apologies. Stole him away from Fordham. Also, I, I I read that running back Hassan Haskins and linebacker Michael Barrett, who was a dual threat quarterback in high school, are also taking quarterback snaps this week. So, or will be once the Michigan football program gets back into the facilities, which hopefully, as we're taping on Sunday, happens today. Uh, but if those are your three quarterbacks, Tom. Yes, that's and that's not going to be great. Regardless of who Ohio State returns or loses, you if you are not playing a Big Ten caliber quarterback, you know, starting a Big Ten co- caliber quarterback in your offense, you're at a severe disadvantage because no matter how many backups are in for Ohio State or whoever you know is playing, like Ronnie Hickman's going to be okay against Dan Valari, Tom. Yeah, and I mean, just for people who don't remember the story of how Dan Valari ended up at Michigan, Michigan had another quarterback committed, I think a four-star kid, who had a uh, career-ending medical issue. I think it was a heart issue. So he had to medically retire, and that happened like right before signing day. And Michigan kind of had this like, well, we need to find someone. And they got a a two-star kid from uh, out on Long uh, Long Island in New York. And you know, I mean, from his perspective, like, sure. Yeah. Why, why would you not take a scholarship to Michigan and go, go play? And I mean, Ohio state has had this at various points in the past. And sometimes it works out like with Kenny Guyton and sometimes it doesn't work out quite that well. And, you know, I mean, this is obviously way too soon to judge Dan Valari since I don't think he has thrown a pass this year. And, uh, you know, this is, this is the first year, like anytime you're throwing a true freshman quarterback in 
to a game in uh, that first, you know, his first season, like that's automatically like, oh, that's probably not great. Like even if CJ Stroud or Jack Miller had to step into a game, that would probably not be fantastic for Ohio State's chances. For But CJ Stroud was like a five star. Jack Miller was a high four star. This is someone who is a two star who, you know, I mean, we have talked about this in the context of Massachusetts high school football before. Uh, Long Island high school football Going from that to playing Ohio State is, you know, that's going from JV difficulty on uh, the old EA football game to like Heisman mode. And, you know, that you can, even if you look pretty good on JV difficulty, like as soon as you click that up the Heisman, it's like, oh, oh, this got real, real fast. Yeah. And he'd be throwing to a group of receivers who are above average to getting more decent by the day. But certainly no Garrett Wilson or Chris Olave there, uh, so it, it will be tough for him. And I don't know what the offensive line is going to look like for Michigan. Like who who is who is back, who isn't? Because like Ohio State, they were down three starters. They have been for most of the season at this point, and, and I don't know who all will be returning there. Uh, the running game with Hassan Haskins has been pretty good. He has been good rushing for 100 yards the last couple of games and is getting better and better and is the the best running back on the team. But stopping the run for the Buckeyes really isn't a major concern right now. And I, I wonder with knowing that you don't have to put a lot of focus on, on Valari if he's the quarterback and being able to stop the run as they are, where do where do where do the points come for Michigan other than rivalry game points? You know, yeah, and it reminds me a little bit of the 2008 game where Michigan really did not have a quarterback that year. It was like Nick Sheridan and Stephen Threet, and I think it was Sheridan by the time that the game rolled around, and Michigan scored seven points. And there was like one drive where Brandon Miner kind of went nuts. Um, he was their running back. He was pretty good. I mean, you could. You could see like the uh, Hassan Haskins channels Brandon Meyer mm-hmm. kind of dri- minor drive and you know and, and they score they score a touchdown you know kind of early or you know they catch Ohio State off guard because Hassan Haskins is playing wildcat quarterback. The problem is the pony does not know a second trick, and once once you figure out that pony's first trick, it's like oh, now there's 53 minutes I still left to play in the game and <laughs> and the bag is empty. So now what and yeah, I, I I don't I don't know where the points would come from for Michigan on Saturday. It, it's just Valari is, you know, I mean, again, like this is this is someone who is was, was kind of a break glass in case of emergency signee, and sometimes those guys turn into something after three years or after four years. It's like, oh, look, he's he's developed some pretty good awareness, and he's you know gotten he's you know refined his technique a little bit, and now he's now he's like a decent, okay, Big Ten quarterback we can have that conversation in 2023 like this year is nope it, it, this is this is not that you do not want to be a michigan quarterback stepping onto the field for the first time in ohio stadium when it's like well ideally you wouldn't see him for three more years that's that's not great and you know and, and if it's not valari and hassan haskins doesn't really work um or works for a little while and then ohio state figures it out like then what I, I had forgotten about Zach Charbonnet. Like, Zach Charbonnet. I don't. Do you know exactly what's going on with Zach Charbonnet? Because I looked and he's averaging six point five yards a carry. I was like, oh, that looks pretty good. He's had nineteen carries this year. Like what? Well, it, his first carry went for seventy yards. So you could do the math on the others. I don't even know that he played last week, not this past week. Nobody played this past week, but like the week before, I'm not even sure he had a carry. So th- that's been his issue. Now we haven't been told like Joe Milton is out. I don't. Ha- that has not been an official thing. It's not even been an official thing that Cade McNamara is out. As far as I know, if Joe Mil, I, I we'll just assume Cade McNamara is out after the, the shoulder that an injury that he suffered. But if Joe Milton can go, that obviously increases Michigan's chances. But it, it feels like they'll maybe swing a little bit more wildly, which you know, sure, it could lead to some connections, but could also lead to more, uh, I don't know, pick sixes and <laughs> interceptions and things like that. And, you know, I, I don't even know. There there are so many rumors with Michigan and, and Joe Milton right now that I don't even want to get into, but they're not good. And I, they turned to him 
when Mac- McNamara went down. So those issues were still out there. <clears throat> those rumors were still out there then. So like they, they went ahead and trusted him. So maybe don't make so much of the issues and, or the rumors, and maybe I shouldn't even bring them up. But Tom, I like rumors. So, uh, but not, not enough to go into them. I just like mentioning that they're out there. But um, yeah, if Milton can play, what's the line? 24, 25? That's probably about right. I mean, I think I think Joe Milton in there get gets them another touchdown drive. So okay, so now you've got the one drive where the Hassan Haskins thing works, and you've got the one drive where Joe Milton, you know, hits Cornelius Johnson for a long touchdown or something like that. Okay, there's there's two. So now you're to fourteen points. I mean, we'll we'll get to the defense, but I don't think they're going to hold Ohio State to thirteen on Saturday. So, and then what happens? And here's the thing about Joe Milton: like you look at his his season stats, and they're like, okay, he's completing fifty four four percent of his passes which is eerily similar to what Rocky Lombardi was doing coming into the game uh, on Saturday against Ohio State up in uh, East Lansing. So, like, that's not super fantastic. And then you look at the game by game, and he's 15 for 22 for 225 yards and a touchdown against Minnesota. Like, wow, what a start. Game two, 32 for 51 for 300 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions, but, you know, 359 yards of total offense against Michigan State. Like, wow, Michigan State's got a pretty good defense. 18 for 34, which is not fantastic, but 330, 344 yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions against Indiana. Like, wow, this is really, they may have something here. And then it just, then, then the car busts through the guardrail and goes off the cliff, and you're 9 for 19 for 98 yards, two picks against Wisconsin, 5 for 12 for 89 yards against Rutgers, and 1 for 3 for 21 yards against Penn State. Like, my assumption is he must have been hurt last week because or two weeks ago in that Penn State game because Kate McNamara was like looked decent for a while and then he was like very clearly hurt and they put Milton in and then they put McNamara back in and it was like why are you putting the guy who's very clearly injured back in the game Milton has to be hurt I mean he 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 must be Uh, otherwise that makes no sense even given the if you don't know what rumors we're talking about, just Google Joe Milton 50 points and uh, you'll you'll figure it out pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, if they were willing to put him in the game, obviously that's not prohibiting them from, you know, I mean, that, that didn't keep them from putting him in the game once. So w- why would you pull him out of the game again if he wasn't hurt? Yeah. And Harbaugh did say after the game that he was banged up. And so that was also a, a reason for maybe him not playing as much, not playing as so well. I you just never know where the ball is going when he throws it. And it's, it's gotta be a terrible feeling as the quarterback coach and the offensive coordinator, but it goes to show you, Tom, I, I, I'm almost sick of saying it, but I'm not because I'm always proven right. The more quarterback is around Jim Harbaugh, the worse they get. And that happened for Joe Milton. It's like he, he, he was going okay. And then boom, and that was it. And, and only took Cade McNamara one game, but of course that was he was injured in the first quarter. So let's not jump on that one just yet. But uh, there is there is there are certainly concerns there. And but maybe with Dan Valaria, if he gets it gets to play, it will be his first game under Jim Harbaugh. Technically, you know, first game playing, maybe he throws for four forty and looks great. And then next week against Purdue, he's you know terrible. I don't know. Uh, like, like he stepped outside the airlock of the space station and he'll be okay for about 30 seconds. Then it's going to go really poorly, but you know, for a little bit, very briefly, it might be okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so let's then switch the gears to the other side of the ball where the Ohio state offense uh, against the, uh, the Michigan defense. I don't, I don't know any good way to put this. Um, it's, it's going to be bad for Michigan because this is a Michigan defense that, was very bad against the pass to start the season and has gotten worse against the run. And now they can't stop anything well. And this is an Ohio State offense that has always been able, able to throw the ball this year, but now is starting to run the ball really well along with Justin Fields. And I don't think they need Justin Fields to be able to run the ball against Michigan, but if they use him, then I don't know that 30 points is enough, Tom. No, and and... I mean, Michigan has the stuff that Michigan has had problems with this year is all the stuff Ohio State's good at. (laughs) I mean, the problems in the defensive backfield with with like maybe not having any good cornerbacks like. 
I mean, Ohio State's defensive backfield has not been fantastic. And I think Dax Hill is the only guy on Michigan's roster who Ohio State would go, all right, we will trade you one of the guys in our defensive backfield for one of the guys in your defensive backfield. So if you, that's one of the weak spots on your team, arguably the weak spot in your team. And the team you're playing is like, yeah, I mean, there's that one guy, but that's about it. Like, mm, that's that's not great. And I mean, Cam McGrone is is someone who I think Ohio State would probably love to have as well, linebacker, but he's hurt. He's he's not going to be playing. I don't I don't believe. And you know, and and you know, I, I have not heard an update on the status of Quiddy Pay. Aiden he, Hutchinson. I, I think he played last week, so he, he's okay. okay. Hutchinson is done for the year. Aiden Hutchinson's out for the year. I mean. Quiddy Pay is like, yeah, Ohio State would take Quiddy Pay to put in their defensive end rotation, and, and they would have taken Aiden Hutchinson while he was healthy. But, you know, it's not, there's just, it's like, okay, well, there's this guy, one guy here, and this one guy here, but he's hurt, and this one guy here, but he's also hurt, and then there's this one guy in the defensive backfield. So if you just don't throw at him, the other guys will be probably be fine. And yeah, it, it, there's just, there are no easy answers. And Michigan, This is one of these things we talk about every year, and it's like, I feel like listeners are probably getting bored of hearing us say this, but like, you have to recruit defensive tackles every once in a while. Like, that's an important part of the playing defense in football process. Like, that's a real important part of the process. And Michigan just for multiple years now has just like not had an interior defensive line. And Ohio State, that was a little bit of a concern for Ohio State at one point this year, but that's because they had guys hurt. Michigan like just doesn't have bodies. It's just like, well, We'll just keep recruiting defensive ends and maybe feed more, some of them more pizza, and then they'll, then they'll be defensive tackles, and it all work itself out. It's like, mm, I don't think that's actually how it works. Especially when, because I went through and looked, they from twenty eight to twenty from twenty eighteen to twenty twenty one, they signed two defensive tackles. They've signed a bunch of defensive ends that you assume they're going to try to fatten up, but these guys are like two hundred thirty five pounds. You know, they're like two hundred forty pound guys that. Nor, most teams would be like, well, do we want them as an outside linebacker? Do we want them as a defensive end? You know, and it's like Michigan's like, no, we're gonna we're gonna figure out some way to turn these guys into defensive tackles. And I don't know that it will ever really happen. And now they do have a commit a defensive tackle commit in twenty twenty two. So mm-hmm. that'll that'll help them win Tom, twenty twenty four. Four, yeah. I mean takes takes a little while to bulk up to uh, Big Ten strength. So yeah, yeah, I mean and 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 that's one. So okay. Mm-hmm. So, well, and, so you've, and the, you've got the problem half solved as long as the guy's healthy by the end of you know November 2024. I mean, and they're going to be losing guys as well, especially mm-hmm. guys who either graduate or exhaust their eligibility or are exhausted by being at Michigan and just want to leave. And I could see at some point they've got like two or three scholarship defensive tackles that they are trying desperately not to have to play, and and they're going out and bringing in people from the transfer portal like crazy. That's that's great. That's not a good way to survive, uh, especially on the interior of your defensive line. Because if you've got nothing there, then I mean you've got nothing. Because the the middle is soft. They can run. Michigan's backup middle linebacker is a former walk on. He's their starter now with Cameron Crone out, Will Shibley. So it's it's not a good situation. But and that's the other thing with Michigan. They always have walk ons in the two deep or former walk ons in the two deep or former walk ons starting. They've got uh, Jess Spate in the defensive tackle rotation, who's a, either a walk on or former walk on. And yes, it's a great story. It's so great. It's you know you cheer for those kids, but that's not how you win Big Ten championships, and that's not how you win rivalry games, and that's how you lose to Penn State, and that's how you lose to Michigan State, and that's how you almost lose to Rutgers. And if you love those great stories, that's great. I bet you don't love the great stories about losing to Michigan State when Michigan State can't beat hardly anybody and you lose to Penn State when Penn State hasn't beaten anybody and you almost lose to Rutgers. Those aren't good stories, people. Well, and as you were talking, I was looking and everyone on the interior of that defensive line, like they're all seniors or grad students, Jess Spate, senior. Uh, Donovan Jeter has been there for a million years. Uh, Christopher Hinton is the only one who's, he's a sophomore and he's like one of the actual defensive tackles they've recruited. And he was, uh, was he, I don't think he was a five-star. I think he was a high four-star, but he's like, okay, there, there's one, but Donovan Jeter has been there forever and just hasn't ever done what you kind of thought he might. Carlo Kemp has been there forever. And it's just and he's like, playing hey. defensive end right now because they have no defensive ends and he's yeah. the best defensive tackle. Yeah. And it's like, okay. And he's, and he's fine, but like, mm-hmm. And then what? It's like having six offensive linemen on your roster. It's like, okay, most of these guys are pretty good, but um, 
you know, if one guy gets hurt, then you're, then you're in trouble. And if two guys get hurt, then all of a sudden you're playing walk-ons. And I mean, they have, I mean, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Jess Spate. They've got another one playing, uh, who's been playing center for them. They're starting center all year was a guy who was a former walk-on in his fifth year in the program. And at the beginning of the year, you heard people say, oh, no, no, no. Well, it's just because he was stuck behind someone good. And it's like, well, mm, generally, if someone has been a, you know, is a former walk-on and hasn't played at all, it's generally like, well, this guy really isn't up to the caliber of what you would expect. And that has been how it's played out. I keep thinking it's Steven Spinellis, but he, he's gone. No, so, uh, Vestardus, Andrew Vestardus. Vestardus, yeah. I knew it was, I knew it was a, long, a long, weird name, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah, Andrew Vestardus. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, this, these are not problems that Michigan should have. I mean, you think about Jim Harbaugh coming in and the satellite camps and all the stuff and all the recruiting they were going to do and they're going to revolutionize recruiting and, and you're six years in and it's like you're still having the, you know, Urban Meyer ran into this where it's like, oh, well, they have to, they have to move uh, Zach Boren from fullback to linebacker because they're really thin at linebacker. Okay, that was the first year. He had, you know, six weeks before signing day that he could recruit and uh, bring guys in. So, okay, like that's, that's why that happened year one. Year six, he was not moving fullbacks to linebacker. He was not, you know, Michigan just moved a, last year, moved a fullback to defensive tackle. Like, you should not be doing this in year five. Like, this is, I mean, you'll hear all sorts of explanations on why Michigan has struggled. Michigan's recruiting operation just is not, is not good. It's just, it's not, there's no organization. There's no, it's just like, well, best available guy in Massachusetts. Okay. And, you know, sometimes you pull a quitty pay out of Rhode Island. That's cool. That's great. But you can't live on Massachusetts and be and compete in the Big Ten. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't work. And they they've pulled, you know, they pull projects out of Massachusetts. They pulled Julius Welshoff out of Germany. And this is his, I think, third year. And he's like, oh, he's turning into a contributing player. And he's been he's been okay, but he's not fantastic. And when you're Michigan, you shouldn't be like, you know, Indiana should be the one that's, you know, pulling these guys out of these crazy places and doing things that that you know, they're just, they're just out hustling other people. Like Michigan should be able to go into good high schools in major American cities and say, Hey, we would you know, give me three of your large human beings, please. And for some reason that just, that just hasn't happened for them. When you're a blue blood program, recruiting is like shooting fish in a barrel because you can go get a lot of who you want. The problem is Michigan is aiming at the wrong barrels. Like they're, they need to, Go to the the barrels in Florida and California and Texas and Ohio instead of let's let's go watch the leaves turn in New England and while we're there we'll also do some recruiting and to go back to the the differences between the two programs Ohio State was about, was was without their middle linebacker this past game tough Borland so what do they do I think they sl- slid Baron Browning in a little bit he's a f- former five star guy they also put Justin Hilliard into the the starting lineup, a former four, five-star guy, and had Dallas Gant, a four-star, top 200 guy waiting in the wings should he need to go in for either of those guys. And kind of gives you an idea of the difference between the programs right now. And with, with Don Brown, who I don't even know that everybody calls, you know, he's Dr. Blitz and whatever. I, I, I swear they're not blitzing that much this year because none of it's working. And then it just puts them in a bad situation. Now, I'm not charting any of it. I, I can just base this off of like the plays made in the backfield because even when Michigan's defense has been not great, they still make a lot of tackles in the backfield and they, they create havoc and the position, the Viper position, which is Michael Barrett. When uh, that position is making big plays, the entire defense is doing well, but he had a, he had a really good game. The first game looked great and has pretty much disappeared in terms of making plays and his tackles and Josh Ross, who is the, the weak side linebacker, the will they're making tackles, you know, like six, five, eight yards downfield. And that's, you're never going to survive doing that. And, and now you've got Ohio state's running a game with Trey Sermon picking up master Teague picking up. There's, I mean, over under on rushing yards Saturday, Tom, I will set at, I don't know, two sixty seven and a half. Yeah, I was right in that 250 to 300 range. Because you got to figure in the fourth quarter, they're going to be running the ball, right? Depends on how, or, close, to, or, depends on how close to 100 they are. That's, that's the real question. When, when, do they take the, when do they take the foot off the pedal? Because uh, as, as BuckeyeScoop.com listener or readers will know, 
Uh, there's a little bit of a history there. Uh, there's been some promised uh, production levels um, at, that uh, Ohio State may be aiming to hit, which also, you know, a little bit of an exclamation point would not hurt for Ohio State if they're, uh, you know, in terms of the college football playoff committee. I think, I, I think at this point, after the Michigan State game, a lot of those questions have been answered because because Texas A and M once again was kind of like, eh, eh, and Ohio State put a little bit of an exclamation point on Michigan State. So that may not be an issue, but if they put up another exclamation point on Saturday, I don't think they would probably mind that. So I do wonder at what point they ease off the throttle, but. I think there's a decent possibility that especially when you get into the third, fourth quarter, you can keep those point. You can keep that scoreboard moving by running the ball. Cause I think, you know, Michigan is already coming in, you know, they came in a year thinner than Ohio state. If they're kind of behind Ohio state in terms of COVID positives and contact tracing and all that kind of stuff, they could be even thinner at that point. And then, you know, tired guys who are not fantastic are a problem. And the guys who are not as good as the guys who are not that great at the start of the game, that's not great. I mean, again, this is we keep running, keep talking about this, and it's like I don't know what the solution is there for Michigan. And we really haven't got into the pass defense, which is, I mean, we're the only ones. (laughs) What do you mean? Because they've given up a lot. Because everyone else has gotten into the pass defense. Yes, (laughs) that's true. Uh, So. Vincent Gray and Jamon Green are their starting corners. And the only reason they've been okay the last couple of weeks is because the running game, the, the, the run defense has gone to heck. And now it's like, well, we don't need to throw deep because we can just run the ball whenever we want. And and when we do want to throw deep, we can, we'll be able to, but they haven't been facing the best quarterbacks of late and they have they haven't needed to go deep. Now Ohio State will be able to do whatever will be able to choose to do whatever, whether it gets completed or accomplished will come down to execution. But whatever Ohio State wants to do, Michigan won't be able to keep them from trying it, including the even with the, the offensive line being who knows what it'll be for Ohio State next week. They can do some max protect things for some double moves because I'll tell you what, the double moves against the Michigan secondary will be there. It'll be effective. And you also don't really need any significant double moves because Chris Olave will be able to just do his thing, you know, on a, on a nine row, even Jamison Williams. Uh, the interesting matchup for me will be Garrett Wilson and Dax Hill in the slot, but I still think uh, Garrett Wilson will have his, his day just because if, if Michigan stays man coverage, then we know those crossing routes are going to be there. And, and if they don't, then they're going to lose some people here and there, and Ohio State will still have some success in the the passing game. But it, it six hundred yards, Tom. Um, that's completely doable in my eyes. Uh, over, I, I would say. <laughs> I would say. I, I mean, honestly, like I think I would say over on that because I think you know Ohio State's going to want to play. You know, four quarters or close to four. You know, I don't. I don't think Ohio State's easing off the pedal in the middle of the third quarter. I mean, that's that's something that they have run into issues with at points this year. They obviously don't want to do that. I don't think they would do that typically against Michigan anyway. I don't think they, I don't think they worry about uh, ruffling any feathers against Michigan. So I don't, I don't think you're going to see them easing up. And, you know, part of this is going to be on Michigan's defense, which is like, okay, do you just want to get battered into submission with the run? Like, like teams have done at points. I mean, like Wisconsin did against them, um, you know, or, or do they want to do, uh, you know, or do you want to risk just getting, getting the top taken off your defense a whole bunch? I mean, that's, Again, there's there's not a fantastic uh, solution there, but you know, I mean, it can be a de- death of a thousand cuts or just a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of big plays. And you know, one one is one is probably a little bit better for them in the fourth quarter, but you know, I think the end result is the same. If you, I mean, if you're just getting battered into submission for three quarters, that fourth quarter looks real, real, real bad. But that, again, I don't I don't think there's a there's a winning solution there for them. Yeah, I agree. And and so that'll do it for our first episode this week. Just like I said, an overview of where things stand with Michigan and and how they compare to Ohio State. We'll get more in depth with things as the week goes on, as long as the the Michigan Wolverines allow us to and continue to assume this game will be played and, and that's how we will operate. And so it, we will have all the coverage that you could possibly want about this game. And then uh then we can watch it on Saturday, everybody together, enjoying what is an annual tradition, even though it'll be 
several weeks after it normally is, but as long as we get it, we'll be fine. So thank you all for listening. Make sure to check out BuckeyeScoop.com where there is all kinds of information about uh, this past game, the upcoming game. Check out the Ask the Insiders board. If you're not yet a member, I promise you, you have missed some really good stuff over the last couple of months, and it's not going to stop right now. Uh, there's still plenty of inside information to go, that is going on for you to be a part of, take part of, and, and join the message board community. And we're all there. So if you don't get enough of us here, and how could you? There's even more of us uh, on the Ask the Insiders board. So thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you guys later.